Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, Lenten uh, lecture uh, by Reverend Father Peter Knox on ecological conversion. Uh, I would like to suggest that uh, if you have any questions, please write them on the chat box. We have very limited time and uh, uh, where Father Peter Knox is, there will be load shedding in an hour's time. So we won't have time for comments, but uh, if you have questions or, or any comments, just write them on the chat box and then we will deal with them as we go along. Uh, Dr. Knox, thank you so much uh, for your availability and for sharing your thoughts with us. And I will hand over to you to start. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Father Father Rampe Hlobo. Let me just welcome you all, as Father Rampe Hlobo has welcomed you all, to this series of Lenten lectures about ecological conversion. The series is being presented jointly or co-hosted by the, so the Social Apostolate um, Desk of the Society of Jesus in Southern Africa. That's the province to which we belong, Father Hlobo and I. And by the Jesuit Institute in Johannesburg, South Africa. So we're co-hosting this series of lectures. As you can see, we begin today on the 20th of, of February, and we go through to the last Tuesday before Holy Week. So 27th, 5th, 12th, 19th, and the 26th of March, uh, the last Tuesday before Holy Week. You're all very welcome to join us every week. The link will be the same week after week after week. Um, those of you who have registered will receive a reminder of the link. Those of you who are not registered through the Jesuit Institute but are attending um, are attending because you found the link elsewhere, just retain this link and you'll be able to use it week after week. The topic of our conversation this evening and for these next six weeks is ecological conversion. Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si, has a whole section on ecological conversion. And he encourages us as Christians to, to start thinking of our world and our relationship to the world in a different way, in a new way. And rethinking things is conversion and specifically relating to our ecology or our environment. So this week I'm going to unpack for us, I'm going to open for us um, bit by bit, what do we mean by these various terms? Some of you may not be Catholic, and so I'll just spend a very brief time talking about Lent, and then what do we mean by ecology? What do we mean by conversion? So today's lecture is really an introduction to the topic that we'll be following for these next six weeks. So here are the six weeks. So the Lenten lectures, Tuesday, Southern African time, seven o'clock to eight o'clock in the evening. Today, we'll have the introduction to the series and to the topic of ecological conversion. Next week, we're going to look at the question of creation. There are creation accounts in Genesis chapter one of the Bible, Genesis chapter two, and we have scientific creation accounts, and we have um, uh, something that tries to merge the scientific and the religious known as Christian evolutionism. And we'll look at these four different accounts of creation next week. On the 5th of March, that's the first Tuesday of March, we're going to have a look at the Christian tradition even before Pope Francis wrote uh, Laudato Si. So we'll start with Francis of Assisi, of course, the great, great man of the West who promoted the care of our, care of our common home the saint who's really associated with ecology and, in, and the environment. Then we'll have a look at the teaching, the brief short teaching of Pope John XXIII on, on care for the creation. Then Paul VI, then Pope John, the twin, John Paul II, then Pope Benedict. We'll have a look at our own Southern African Catholic Bishops Conference. We'll look at some of the teaching of the German bishops We'll look at the World Council of Churches. And finally, in week uh, the 5th of March, we'll have a look at what Patriarch Bartholomew, the ecumenical patriarch of the, of the um, Orthodox churches, has taught about 
uh, ecological conversion. On the 12th of March, we'll come to the question of why care for our common home? What's so special about this home? Why don't we just carry on living as always, as we always have done? Um, and look at some of the scientific theory and some of what Pope Francis writes about what is happening to our common home. That'll be the fourth lecture in this series. On the fifth lecture, we're going to have a look at teachings from the Catholic social tradition, known as Catholic social teaching. I'm going to take most of those points from the compendium of the social doctrine of the church. And um, chapter 10, particularly of that compendium, which deals with safeguarding our environment. It won't be exclusively from the compendium, but there are a lot of there's a lot of teaching in the Catholic tradition about care for the environment. And then the final final lecture of the series on March the 25th, we'll look at what we can do. We as individuals, I want us to leave this section, this series of lectures, feeling empowered, feeling that I can actually do something that makes a difference. It's not just up there at the level of governments and the international community, but what I can do in my own community, in my own family, in my own home, what I can do to make a significant contribution to care for our common home. So that's the six lectures that we're going to have in this series, um, and they'll unfold one by one. Let's begin with a quotation from Pope Francis from the year 2015. So these words are eight years old already. And Pope Francis is encouraging us to have a spiritual relationship with the environment. He talks of ecological spirituality. So in the, in the section of Laudato Si, the encyclical for care for our common home, he says that it's not just a head trip, it's not just a trip about what we do, but we have to have a spiritual relationship, an ecological spirituality with the world that God has put here, the world on which we're living. And that spiritual relationship should be grounded in convictions of our faith, convictions which derive from the gospel. And Pope Francis says that our spirituality should make us more passionate in our concern to protect the world. So our spirituality, and many of us, I'm sure, are at this point already, many of us have a deep, deep passion for our environment and a deep concern about what's going wrong and the problems that we see uh, in the environment. And with a deeper spirituality, we pray about it, we think about it, we reflect about it, we feel the pain of the earth, we suffer with the earth, and we suffer with the people on our planet who are suffering because of the environment. Um, and this spirituality should sustain us, it should inspire us, it shouldn't be only a guilt trip, oh, I used three gallons of petrol today, or I used, I burned a kilogram of coal, or I contributed so much to greenhouse, so much to greenhouse gases, it should be a sustaining spirituality, a spirituality that inspires us and keeps us going, um, and that motivates us, encourages us, nourishes us, and gives our communities and ourselves as individuals some sense of meaning. Whatever we do can be done because we care for the environment. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing. That's what I hope we're going to address during these days. For those of you who either are not Catholic or you need a reminder of what Lent is, Lent, these eight weeks before Easter, six weeks before Easter, are a time of reflection, repentance, reconciliation, a time when we connect ourselves with Jesus, the Son of God, who's suffering with us and suffering with the broken world. And so we connect ourselves, we align ourselves more to the story of Jesus, to the story of salvation, the history of salvation in Jesus Christ. During the time of Lent, traditionally, we focus on three activities, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And we heard these three activities being explained to us in the gospel on Ash Wednesday, the gospel from chapter six of, of, of Matthew, um, the passage from chapter six of Matthew's gospel. 
This year, however, Pope Francis is encouraging us to go beyond simply prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and he's encouraging us to listen to the cry of the earth, which is the cry of the poor. He sees the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor as a single passion narrative, a single story of suffering, and we should open our hearts and open our open our compassion to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. He's encouraging us to have or to undergo an ecological conversion. So during this Lent period, we begin to develop habits which are not going to end there during Lent, but will carry on. They'll be part of our lives as we, as we go forth. Good habits we maintain and sustain through the rest of the year. Question is, what is ecology? Many people have forgotten what they studied in matric biology or standard seven biology or something like that. You may have come across the word ecology and we're not, we sort of not in touch with that part of our schooling anymore. What is ecology? Ecology is everything that surrounds us, everything of which we are part. We're not separate from the environment. We're not cut off from the natural world as though it's something outside of us. We are part of the natural world and the natural world is part of us. We are living organisms. We're not somehow higher than nature or above nature or kind of the super beings or the intellectual beings which are somehow on a different planet or a different level of being to nature. Nature is part of us and we are part of nature. Um, Pope Francis calls this integral ecology, the notion that everything is interconnected, that we are also interconnected with nature, that, that kind of we're part of the environment and the, we're part of the ecology. Our cities are part of the ecology. I see there's somebody who's joining us from the United States. He's part of a very, very different urban ecology to, uh, to the rest of us living in Africa, or those of us who are living in villages or in the countryside. We're also part of our, of our environment. We're not separate or cut off from the environment. So if that's Lent, we understand what Lent is. We've looked at um, ecology. Francis is, Pope Francis is encouraging us to have an ecological conversion. What is conversion? If we look at the beginning of Mark's gospel, Jesus comes and he announces, the reign of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. So the verbs repentance has to do with, we'll look at that in a minute. Belief has to do with the intellectual part of our lives. Repent and believe the good news. The good news is that God wants to save. God comes into the world and God saves. Jesus, his name is God saves, God the Savior. Jesus gives us many parables. Jesus tells us many, many stories trying to illustrate what the reign of God is like. And really, apart from the parables, we don't have the exact outline of the reign of God. We don't have a structure. We don't have the kind of the constitution as we have the constitution of a country or a kingdom, but we don't really know what the reign of God is like, but we know what the reign of God is not like. We know that the reign of God isn't filled with division, pollution, poverty, struggle. We believe that God wants us to come beyond all of these troubles that we experience in our own time. A reign where Jesus is Lord, where Jesus is King, is different to the reign where we have President Ramaphosa or President Biden or whoever. It's somehow different. God is a much more benevolent uh, ruler or a person in charge of the reign of God. And we believe that we'll be will be somehow more integrated with each other and with the environment during the reign of God. Ecological conversion, any kind of conversion, has an element of repentance, um, being sorry for our actions, being truly, um, being truly wanting to change, wanting, having the desire to move on, to start a new way of being, a new way of living in the world, making new resolutions, a new, a new life. 
with the help of God. This is something we cannot do by ourselves. We don't save ourselves. We don't pull ourselves up by our own bootstrings. We depend on the help of God. We rely on the Holy Spirit to help us to make changes where change is necessary in our lives. The gift of, of repentance, the gift of sorrow, is a gift from the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a gift. We may not feel good. It may not feel nice and warm and comfortable. But repentance is a gift from the Holy Spirit. What we have to repent of. Now, that's, that's a question that comes to us from the outside. It's a question that we ourselves perhaps are not, um, not in control of. And I refer us to an article written more than 50 years ago by an author called Lynn White, um, published in the Journal of Science in the year 1967. And he talks about the historical root of the ecological crisis. And he, his argument, and Pope Francis tends to agree with him, is that Christians need to repent. Christians need to rethink, I'll come to that in a minute, our relationship with the environment. He says Christians, and he himself accuses Christians of destroying God's creation. We have this injunction in Genesis chapter one to subdue the earth, the first creation account that we'll have a look at next week. Um, subdue the earth, we're told, and Christians have taken that very, very seriously, and we've gone on and subdued the earth, and that's problematic for the earth, because, because the earth is in trouble now. And Lynn White says Christians are really responsible for the destruction of God's creation. He says as we're entering, so this is 1967, the final third of the 20th century, um, People are becoming much, much more concerned. Concern is mounting feverishly about the ecological backlash. He sees the environment or the earth is beginning to strike back or the earth is beginning to kind of make itself felt. The earth is speaking. We have to start listening. Um, and so he says that around the world, this concern for the earth is growing. What is, where has it all come from? He traces it back to Western science, which he calls modern science. Modern science and modern, tech and modern technology are at least partly um, to be explained as a phenomenon of the Occidental, the Western deliberate realization of the Christian doctrine of human transcendence. Uh, so this Western scientific method is kind of making things happen, go and change, go and be a master of the earth. Um, and that comes from our Christian mentality. This is kind of Western philosophy. It's maybe not African philosophy or Aboriginal philosophy, but Western philosophy is go and make things happen, do things. And he says that Christianity, which has informed the West for so many centuries, carries a large burden of guilt. Christianity in the Christian tradition carries a large burden of guilt for that whole Western mentality. What we do about ecology, what we do about ecology, um, depend. What we do about ecology depends on our ideas of the relationship between human beings and nature. Um, we. If we carry on with the same ideas, the same way of thinking that we're above nature, that we somehow put there to control and to dominate nature, then we're not going to change. We'll just continue the way we are. Lynn White continues, more science and more technology aren't going to get us out of the present mess. There's a crisis of ecology at the moment. And if we just carry on the same way, the same track, if we just carry on trying to deal with things in a technological manner, finding technological solutions for the problems we have, we're not going to get anywhere. He says we need to find a new religion, or at least we have to rethink our Christian religion, the present religion. Um, the, the ecological crisis will continue to worsen until we either reject the Christian axiom that has no reason for existence, 
except to save man, for man, except to serve man, I'm sorry. If we reject this, then maybe we can start looking at ecology, at the environment, at the world, at mother nature. If we start looking at mother nature differently, then we'll have more respect for mother nature and take mother nature's needs into consideration. Pope Francis in Laudato Si tends to agree with Lynn White's um, analysis. At least Pope Francis uses the term anthropocentrism, an excessive anthropo anthropocentrism, an excessive understanding that humans are at the center of creation and humans are the purpose and the reason that creation exists. Pope Benedict, before Pope Francis obviously, takes issue with uh, Lynn White and Pope Benedict, when he's speaking to a seminary in Austria, I think it's in Austria, he says, well, we can't take Lynn White's analysis um, entirely as though that's the only way of understanding what's going wrong with the world. So Pope Francis and Pope Benedict react against Lynn White, um, one positively, Pope Francis, and one a little bit more cautiously, Pope Benedict. So the ecological crisis, if Lynn White mentioned it in 1967, five years later, the United Nations had its very first conference on the environment. Some of you may remember the Stockholm crisis, the Stockholm conference in 1972. Um, some of us may not remember that, we are too young. But since Stockholm, there have been numerous um, United Nations conferences about the environment and lots and lots of protocols have been written. There's a lot of agreement around the world that we really have to take care of our world more seriously. And so I just list some here, not all of them. This is a selection of ones that we're, we're hearing about. And depending on where we are and depending on what our activities are, our relationship to the environment uh, may have to do with the sea, it may have to do with biological diversity or no biodiversity, um, ozone, we may have we have, may have concerns about nuclear waste and nuclear problems, we may be concerned about persistent organic pollutants, persistent organic pollutants, for example, drugs and pharmaceuticals, which end up in our water supply, which end up in our food. There, there are protocols in the United Nations where countries have agreed to address this issue of persist persistent organic pollutants like plastics as well. There's the law of the seas, which has been going on for decades and decades. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Control or climate change. This is probably the most pressing concern and the one that people are most aware of at the moment, climate change. Um, my, my office at the moment says it's 27 degrees. So that's the temperature in my office at the moment, which is much, much hotter than it should be at half past seven at night. Um, and it's been a hot day and sure, we, we expect it to be hot in summer, but many of us probably have stories or experiences about climate change. And we'll have ways of saying, yeah, it's not the way it used to be when I was a child or when I was growing up. The United Nations have proposed, firstly, the Millennium Development Goals. Now they've been changed to the sus uh, Sustainable Development Goals, um, 17 goals, where we hope to see humanity, all of humanity, sort of being able to survive in a sustainable way, in a way that doesn't deplete the environment. There are UN conventions on hazardous waste. There's a convention in the international trade of endangered species. So if you have a pet which really shouldn't be a pet, it should be out in the wild, then it's quite possible that you're in contravention of this of CITES, the convention in the international trade in endangered species. There are conventions on watercourses and pollution of watercourses and not blocking watercourses and allowing water to go through and kind of nourish um, all the people downstream. There are conventions on the high seas. There's a convention on biosafety that is trying to prevent diseases crossing from one species to another. We've been very, very aware of one particular zoonosis that is a species, a virus crossing from 
animals to humans in the year 2019, we encountered COVID-19 or coronavirus-19. And that, if, if the Convention on Biosafety had been taken really seriously, it's quite possible that corona-19 or COVID-19 wouldn't have happened to us. So there are conventions, existing conventions before 2019 about biosafety. I have a friend who's a vet, veterinary scientist, and she's a vet. Whenever she goes into, whenever she goes into chicken farms or chicken runs, she has to do a complete wash down. She has to change her clothing when she comes out, so that any, for example, avian influenza doesn't spread from her from one farm through her from one farm to another. And so there are very strict protocols in South Africa on biosafety but somehow those protocols were not observed. And so coronavirus spread around the world. There are conventions on pesticides, there are conventions on species which are migrating from the north to the south. Birds, for example, can cover 17,000 kilometers migrating from the Russian Arctic down to South Africa. We have whales and we have fish migrating all around the world, all around the seas. And so over the last, 52 years since the first UN conference on the environment, there have been all sorts of con conferences which happen on a regular basis about all of these things relating to our environment. In the same year as the, as the Stockholm conference, there was a publication of a book called The Limits to Growth. And so the so-called Club of Rome, a lot of scientists, really based in, in, um, in the United States, in um, the city will come to me, Chicago, and they call themselves the Club of Rome. I'm not entirely sure why. They did a lot of numerical modeling. They used kind of computers to see whether the earth can continue to sustain growth. And it's become very evident, certainly since 1972, that the earth is a limited space. Our world is limited. We cannot have continued growth of populations. We cannot have continued growth of economies. The earth has a limit to the amount of, of everything that it can provide, to the amount of pollution that it can absorb. And so we have really taken this Club of Rome report seriously. In the year 2015, uh, when Pope Francis published Laudato Si, his encyclical on care for our common home. There was another group of scientists, so really contemporary with the publication of Laudato Si, another group of scientists based in Stockholm, but these are scientists around the world, who are saying that our planet has boundaries. Our planet cannot continue to absorb and to give and to, to kind of accept all sorts of strange things. And these scientists promoted a theory called planetary boundary theory. This is the most recent version, the 2023 update. So it's eight years old now, as the encyclical is eight years old. And Pope Francis was using at least six of these planetary boundaries when he was talking about what's going on in our common, in our common home, when he's looking at what's going wrong in the world. Uh, we've dealt, many of us may remember discussions about the hole in the ozone layer which in scientific terms was called stratospheric ozone depletion. The Montreal Protocol in the 1980s recognized this and countries around the world have stopped using chemicals that deplete the ozone layer. Um, there are all sorts of things about aerosol loading. So this is dust and smog and kind of dust storms that blow across the Sahara, dust storms occasionally blowing across the Namib and the Kalahari deserts and very, very small particles which get into human lungs and get into the lungs of animals. They cover the, the surfaces of leaves and things like that. And that's these particles are tiny, tiny particles, but they're not dissolved in the air. Eventually, they deposit where they shouldn't be. There's ocean acidification. The pH of the oceans is slowly depleting, decreasing. Um, and the acid of the oceans is burning or is dissolving the coral reefs and the coral reefs, which are the fisheries, the nurseries for many, many fisheries around the world, the coral reefs are unable to sustain 
um, the eggs and the baby baby fish that are there in the coral. Um, two chemicals in particular, nitrogen and phosphorus, have been used for, for chemical fertilizers. And so the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle appear to be out of balance now. Too much nitrogen, too much nitrogen, too many nitrates are coming into the atmosphere, too many phosphates are flowing into rivers. And so the biogeochemical flows, the chemicals, so the chemicals in the earth which are necessary for life, they seem to be out of balance. And that's problematic. And these things which are here in red in planetary boundary theory, saying that we've moved into a dangerous space. We don't know how precisely how much nitrates, how many nitrates the earth can absorb or the, the atmosphere can absorb, but we're in a space where there's danger. Um, the green space, so these first three planetary boundaries appear to be safe. There's no panic about them, but we really have to start thinking about nitrates and phosphates about radioactivity, about biosphere integrity, that is um, uh, um, biological, biological and genetic um, integrity. We've got all of the we've got all of the species or insignificant species that are depleting. Uh, and so in planetary boundary theory, uh, we really need to be concerned about these things here, which are mostly on the left-hand side of the graph. There's tons and tons and tons of material written about planetary boundaries, but the notion is, the important thing is, the Earth can only absorb, and the Earth can only provide so much, and then it becomes problematic. Pope Francis in Laudato Si is rather sanguine. He says, Oh, it's not really a problem. It's not really a problem of um, too many people. It's really a problem that the goods of the earth are not spread evenly. If we had a much, much more equitable way of distributing the goods of the earth, the earth can, the population of the earth can continue to grow. Now, I think that's very, very optimistic and is possibly not entirely accurate, but I wouldn't go up against the Pope on this. I mean, he's a scientist. I've got a bit of scientific background as well, and it really, you know, scientists very often don't agree with each other. But I don't think he would disagree that there's, there are problems in the way many of these, many of these um, boundaries are being exceeded in the world. So in this era of ecological collapse, what would we do? What should we do? Many of us feel there's nothing I can do. Really, what, what, is, there that, what is there that I can do? I'm a little individual. I'm living in Johannesburg. Um, I'm not a professional scientist. I don't know how to convince people. So many young people nowadays have wear a bracelet like this around their wrists saying, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What should I do? I should do what Jesus would do. And so they start thinking, what would our Lord's response be in a situation like this? And so just Jesus coming, well, his mother Mary comes to him at the wedding feast in Cana. We may remember that story, Jesus' first public miracle. Mary comes to Jesus and says, they've run out of wine. Jesus says, well, what's that got to do with me? And his attitude appears to be, that's not my problem. This is not my issue. They should have made wine. They should have made provisions. And then Mary, the mother of Jesus, says to him, says to the, to the servants there at the wine feast, just do what he tells you. And I think that's what we have to try and work out in our ecological conversion. What is he telling us? What do we have to do? What would Jesus do in this situation? What do we need to do? Christianity has often been accused of being other world focused, focused on the hereafter, focused on, put your mind, St. Paul says, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of this earth. Well, that can be problematic because we have to live on this earth. We have to take care for this earth. We have to take care for the people, our fellow citizens of the earth. We shouldn't allow ourselves to be accused of being 
other focused or otherworldly focused, we really take a responsibility for what's going on here on the earth as well. At the Second Vatican Council, where all the bishops from around the world, well over 2,300 bishops, got together in the 1960s, the most significant church event of the 20th century, all the bishops came from around the world and said, we shouldn't be kind of focused only on eternity, on heaven, on another world. We should cooperate in the international world order. We should promote the development and caring for the vulnerable. We shouldn't see the United Nations, this big secular organization, sometimes on a different track to the Catholic Church. We shouldn't perceive it to be the enemy of the church or any religion. The United Nations, the world, people around the world, sort of the gathered um, people around the world are trying to make a sustainable, livable world possible for all people. We shouldn't see them as the competition. In fact, the Catholic Church has observer status and now has member status at the United Nations. And the Catholic Church is allowed to make its contribution as the Holy See, as a state, to many of the discussions taking place at the United Nations. The secular world and the religious world may be on different tracks. The Catholic Church, the Universal Church, and the United Nations may be on different tracks, but we're working towards similar goals, that is the flourishing of human beings. I'll take just one document from the, from the Second Vatican Council. Here we have it in St. Peter's Basilica, the year 1962 to 1965. The bishops met for 10 weeks or nine weeks at a time over four years between October and December in 62, 63, 64, 65. And some people say that was the largest gathering or the largest meeting that has ever taken place in the world, the largest talk shop that the world has ever had. Well, they produced at the end of, of the Second Vatican Council, a document called Gaudium et Spes, Gaudium et Spes, faith, uh, the, the hopes, the joys and the hopes of our world. And it's really about the church in the world. And in Gaudium et Spes, they say, firstly, that we're not cut off from the world. We shouldn't see ourselves as somehow above or better than the world. Whoever promotes, so I'm reading what's blue here. I don't know whether you can read the blue. Whoever promotes the human community at family level, as Marfam does at the cultural level, in the economic level, socially and politically, nationally and internationally, such a person, according to God's design, is contributing to the church as well, to the extent that the church depends on things outside of itself. The church can't live in a bubble. We're not living on planets, planet Mars. We're living here on planet Earth. And the church depends on the well-being, and Christians depend on the well-being of the earth, of our countries. Uh, so that was in paragraph 44. I jump now to paragraph 88. Christians should cooperate willingly and wholeheartedly in establishing an international order. So that means collaborating with the United Nations, an international order that includes a genuine respect for all freedoms, the freedom of voting, the freedom of choice, an amicable fraternity between all people. Christians are to be praised when they, and supported, when they volunteer their services to help other men and other women and other nations. Indeed, it's the duty of the whole people of God, following the world, the word, and the example of the bishops, to alleviate, as far as we're able to do so, the sufferings of our modern age. So the bishops are saying we really have to be involved. This is the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern age. We really have to be involved in the issues of the world. And we can't say, leave that to the professionals, leave that to the United Nations. We really have to ourselves be involved in the, pastoral cons in the, in the concerns of the world. So Pope Francis writes the encyclical Laudato Si. It's basically, this is very complicated. It takes too much time. It's the basic routine of see, judge, of Laudato Si is see, judge, act. It's an encyclical in six chapters. And it's like, it follows the pastoral circle. Those of you who are familiar with the pastoral circle, we start with seeing what's going on in the world, 
we see, then once we see what's going on, we make a, pass, a faith judgment, a social judgment, a, a judgment from the principles of Catholic social teaching. And then Pope Francis says we must move into action. We don't just understand, we don't just see what's going on, we move into action. We dialogue with all people. And then the final chapter says, we have to educate ourselves, we have to educate our children, we have to change our spirituality. Our spirituality should make practical demands on who we are and how we live in the world. And so Pope Francis in chapter six proposes an ecological spirituality. And that's what we're going to be looking at bit by bit over, this, over these six weeks. And then the end of the encyclical, Pope Francis offers us two prayers. If you want to take anything from the encyclical, you can take two prayers. If you want to get more involved in the encyclical, you can begin this kind of conversion. Pope Francis focuses on exaggerated anthropocentrism, the notion that anthropos, human beings, are at the center or somehow at the pinnacle or the peak of, of the world. Everything serves man. Women somehow are below man. Money, um, oil, mineral resources, animals, robotics, anything agricultural is there at the service of humankind. And then the things which are even further from us, they're even further down on the on a kind of scale of importance or on, a, on an ontological scale. So Pope Francis says we have to move away from an anthropocentric understanding of the world, like I am the center of everything, to a cosmocentrism where the world is at the center and human beings, men and women and the disabled and people who have got all sorts of difficulties, where the world is at the center and we are part of that world. We see ourselves as part of a network of life, a network of, of um, the material world provided there for us, but also we are there to provide for the world. We don't dominate. We're not on top of any, any, um, any kind of ontological, ontological um, reality. We're part of the world. In German, they use the word umdenken, to rethink, to think differently, to change our mind completely. And I think that's a dimension of conversion that we have to umdenk and we have to think in new ways. We have to look at the way we've understood things in the past and say, no, there's another way of seeing things. There's another way of kind of being in touch with our world and being part of our world. So um, Pope Francis is very clear that human beings are at the root of the ecological crisis. Certainly there are cycles, there are solar cycles, there are cycles of intensity. I'll look, have a look at those in a minute. There are cycles which are beyond our control, which are happening on the global scale, um, cycles of, of, of um, concentrations of carbon dioxide, which have nothing to do with human beings. Um, there are these cycles, but the present ecological crisis has anthropological roots. We human beings, particularly since the Industrial Revolution, are at the crisis at the center of the global climate change crisis. And no serious scientist would dispute this. And I'm sort of putting it out there that I take it as presumed for this series of lectures that we human beings have have a large responsibility for the ecological crisis at the moment. And we human beings have to, therefore, change our behavior as much as we can to try to undo the damage. Now, a lot of the damage has been taking place on a global scale over 200 years. And what, what contribution I can make is minimal, but it's significant. It's not to be ignored. There are people who point out, and scientists can, can show, that there have been waves of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the concentration goes up and down and up and down and up and down over the last 400,000 years. 
There's no question about that. You can look at trees, you can look at fossil records, you can look at records in the ice, in ice core samples and things like that. And you see there are waves of concentrations of carbon dioxide. And those waves of concentrations of carbon dioxide go are followed relatively closely by temperature changes in the world. And if the solid line here is the current temperature, the current temperature in the world, and we're sort of going above that current temperature. We're on a trajectory at the moment where the global temperature is rising. And a lot of that has to do with human activity. Okay, we're just at this tiny little bit here of increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide, but that is anthropogenic. That's caused by human beings. And this is my presumption. It's a presumption of Pope Francis. Some of you may not agree with it, but this is what modern um, geoscience is telling us. This we certainly can't dispute. If we try to dispute the concentration of carbon dioxide, this we cannot dispute. Pope Francis says in writes in Laudato Si, number 21, the earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an enormous pile of filth. This is the mess that we have created. Our consumer culture, all the packaging we take, all the packaging we use, we see here boxes, we see here plastic, we see all sorts of things. If you drive past a waste, a waste dump, we smell it, we see it, we see it, the waste is just growing more and more and more. And Pope Francis laments that our home is beginning to look more and more like an enormous pile of filth. And he says, again in Laudato Si, that we are not dealing with two crises, two separate crises, an environmental crisis and a social crisis, but he says the connection between the environment and society is intimate. We're dealing with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. So we see here a drought, presumably in India, and we see this is a social issue. Kids have to walk miles just to collect a certain amount of water for family use. That generates issues about their education. And, and so the, the physical crisis is expressing itself in a social crisis. So we're coming to 50 minutes past. I'm stopping at 50 minutes and we'll have 10 minutes of questions. Just something that you may like to do before we meet again. Um, you can go to laudatocelent.org if you want to download a Lenten calendar, if you want to download an activity that you might consider doing each day during this Lent. Um, so there's a calendar you can download at laudatocelent.org or you can, so this is now put out by the Jesuits and the Ignatian family, the Ignatian Solidarity Network. They're suggesting you might do other things. Waste less food during, during Lent. So there are suggestions for a Lenten food waste fast. So rather than fasting from food, fast from wasting food. Use all the food you buy. Pope Francis says very clearly and repeatedly, we should never put more food onto our table. We should never cook more food than we can reasonably be expected to consume. We shouldn't be filling out our fridge with Tupperwares after each meal or with plastic containers after each meal of leftover food. Our food should be calculated to be sufficient for the needs of the day or the needs of the time. So the Jesuits, the Ignatian Solidarity Network is proposing that we have a fast from food waste during Lent. And they're also proposing something much, much more challenging, I think, is to buy little during Lent. Or they're talking about no buy Lent. Pope Francis is in Laudato Si writes about consumerism. People feel their meaning is somehow attached. Some people feel the meaning is somehow attached to what they buy, what they consume. And Pope Francis really discourages us from this consumerism. And if you can do this during Lent, uh, you can find on this website, IGSOL, Ignatian Solidarity Network, um, you can find something that you might do for your Lenten journey. So there's a just a couple of suggestions if you want to get involved in something relating to the environment during Lent, 
apart from simply attending lectures, uh, you can look at some of these websites which have suggestions. It's now 10.2. 10 um, Father Flobo, I hand over to you if you'd like to take over again, please. Thank you, Dr. Knox. Uh, we, we have uh, about three questions or comments. Uh, I think, yeah. Let me start with uh, the one from uh, Musa Shangase. Uh, he just, uh, it's on the chat box. Is it true that variations in solar activity is one of the causes of climate change? If yes, how? And uh, the second one is, uh, mid last year, it was reported that global carbon emissions from fossil fuels reached record levels of 36.8 billion tons, up by 1.1% from 2022. It was estimated that by the end of 2023, levels would uh, reach 40.9 billion tons. NCAS UK. What are the current readings? And then uh, Bright asked uh, uh, one question, which I think you've dealt with in one of your presentations last year. I didn't hear any reference to Laudate Deum. I have not read the whole document myself. So my question is that does it not have additional insights and recommendations, especially for the faithful building on Laudato C? And then Tony Rollins, it is interesting that the different the different popes, uh, the different Pope Francis dogs, even after Laudato Si, don't all have this eco focus, e.g., uh, Maurice Letatia and uh, Fratelli Tutti. So, if you could uh, talk to those, please, Dr. Knox. Okay, thank you. Let's try and deal with them in the order in which you mentioned them, Dr. Lobo. Um, so let's go back to this graph. Um, for Mr. Shangas say, so maybe maybe you put that into the chat box before I before I presented this this set of graphs to us. Um, we've got carbon dioxide concentrations go up and down and up and down and up and down. And some of them may have been responsible for mass extinctions. So as as carbon dioxide concentrations have gone down, so temperatures have gone down. Remember, carbon dioxide is known as a greenhouse gas. It's a gas that kind of retains heat in the atmosphere. If the temperature goes too low, for example, 15 degrees below um, our current temperature, then many of the reptiles, cold-blooded creatures, many of the dinosaurs, cold-blooded creatures, were unable to survive because of concentrations because of low temperatures. And so as carbon dioxide um, concentrations in the atmosphere fluctuate, then temperatures have fluctuated over 400,000 years. What most geoscientists are saying at the moment, and we got some of these readings of concentrations from um, the second questioner. Um, oh, that's Musa Shanghai saying. Um, so we got readings of these concentrations that People have said, and it was reported, that last year was the hottest year on temperature on, on record. The year 2023, we seem to have already exceeded the goal of one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So the concentration of carbon dioxide, and in fact methane, which is another very important greenhouse gas, the concentration is still increasing in the atmosphere. Um, the aim we're looking, or what we aim for, is 350 parts per million, or that's that's a concentration rather than a total number of 40.9 billion tons. We're trying to aim for less than 350 parts per million in the atmosphere, and that will kind of reduce the amount of greenhouse retention of heat. And so we really want to get below that. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into precise details. You can find the precise details. Obviously, you know where to look. And so you can find the precise details if you want to scare yourself to death. In response to Bright Mascati's question, Laudato Deum is, an, is a very, very short document. Here is Laudato Si. 
it's 60 something pages. Laudate Deum is 14 pages, much, much shorter document put out by Pope Francis last year. And it's really uh, an exhortation. People, we have to take this more seriously. He put it out ahead of COP28, which was the meeting about global on of the framework convention on climate change last year. He said, we really need to take COP28 seriously. And at COP28, we have to take seriously the the stopping of uh, um, fossil fuels. And so really the major step from Laudato Si in 2015 to Laudate Deum in 2023, the major step is identifying fossil fuels and saying we have to put a stop to the use of fossil fuels. Um, and basically Pope Francis is saying it's getting urgent. Guys, if I didn't get your attention in 2015, now let me call your attention back to um, Laudato Si and the problems there. Um, so a question from Tony Rowland. So Pope Francis has put out many documents, apostolic exhortations, for example, on marriage and love in the family, exhortations on social concern, exhortations uh, um, encyclicals and things like that. And he's always got this kind of social uh, concern at the back of his mind. And if, if environmental issues or ecological issues are causing social suffering, Pope Francis is focusing on other issues which are causing suffering. For example, suffering in families. We have to care for families that are that are suffering. And kind of there's this connection, there's this nexus, there's this going together of social concerns and environmental concerns. And he's not repeating himself again and again and again. Um, he's trying to avoid repeating himself. But you will find in Fratelli Tutti, for example, which he put out during the, the pandemic, it's an exhortation about caring for our brothers and it's an encyclical about caring for our brothers and sisters. He says, he mentions the ecological issues as well. Um, okay, so that's the four questions that I've heard. I think we're coming to the end of our time. My lights are going to go off in two minutes time. Thank you to ESCOM. That is your <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, in, in Knox. I, I think uh, there was one other request which was made mm -hmm. on the chat box about sharing the the presentation, and I'm assuming that the Jesuit Institute uh, will uh, put a this presentation on on the YouTube. Uh, account on the website, isn't it? Am I, am I correct? You're correct. So I'm busy recording at the moment. So you, you're aware that this meeting is being recorded. I'm recording it at the moment. I'm going to give it to our IT genius um, tomorrow morning when he comes to the office and he's going to top and tail it. And then it'll go on to the YouTube account of the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. So those of you who want to receive it or follow it on again, if you want to just pick up on something or question something or pursue it in greater depth, you can pick it up after tomorrow on the YouTube account of the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. I see there's another question about volcanic eruptions and um, there's another natural, yes. natural fires from somebody called iPhone or somebody checking in with his or her iPhone. Natural fires and volcanic eruptions certainly do contribute to global greenhouse gases. And these are beyond human control. And there's no question that these are not anthropogenic. If it's if we're talking about natural fires, then they're not human or man-made man fires. But interestingly, I was reading an article on Sunday about all of the fires that have been burning in the Western Cape. And the majority of them have been caused by human beings, by negligence, by people lighting fires, by people throwing out cigarette butts and things like that. So natural fires, at least looking in the Western Cape in the last month or December and January, these are not natural, but human made. But there are natural fires, certainly. Right. And there are fires from, from, uh, from human beings. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Knox. Uh, I think we've reached uh, before before ESCOM cuts cuts your electricity supply there that side. Uh, let us uh, thank the people for attending. Thank you so much, Dr. Knox, yourself for the presentation. And just a reminder that uh, we will be having another, uh, which will be a follow up on what uh, you presented today. And uh, also to remind uh, people that uh, they can also register at retreat, uh, uh, send an email org .za, and uh, they can receive more information and uh, uh, some more uh, uh, information from, from, from the Jesuit Institute there. Um, we have dealt with all the questions and uh, we thank you for attending. Thank you for your time and hope to see you more of you again next week on uh, Tuesday, same time on the 27th of February. Many thanks everybody and thank you Dr. Knox once more.